doing the work was sitting there with my eyes closed thinking, who is the person I want to be? Welcome to the Juggling the Chaos of Recovery podcast, where we focus on health and wellness and overcoming all types of addictions. You're in the right place if you're a mom, dad, sibling, or caregiver who has a loved one who is or was struggling with an eating disorder or any other kind of addiction. In a time where everything seems heavy, I'm here to bring you a very real yet lighthearted take on what the heck we're all supposed to do with our lives while we care for our loved ones who are struggling. One thing holds true throughout it all. You can't juggle the chaos without smiling, at least a little bit. Well, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am your host, Moira, and um, I, if you've heard me on the podcast before, I have talked about mindset and how important mindset is. And um, today, my guest and I, Molly Brown, and I are going to talk about mindset. And so I'm super excited about that. And I was just sharing with her before we went live that, you know, I do have a, a wellness business. I'm an entrepreneur in the wellness direct selling space and have been for almost um, 23 years and was talking to some of my teammates the other night and just hanging out and and just talking and visiting and their kids were playing in the pool and things like that. And they just started, we really, they started to talk about some, as I would call just a lot of drama and things like that. And we had a, you know, quite a bit of discussion and I was supporting them and talking and sharing ideas and things like that. But it really got down to at the end about mindset. And I said, you know, it's just really a matter of having a different mindset when you're either helping, you know, trying to grow your business or you're trying to help others or you're trying to deal with other people on your team and personalities and things like that. So I'm excited today for Molly to share with us um, because she's a mindset engineer and um, she's got some cool things that she does um, and talks about in regards to mindset. But she also has an eating disorder story that I also think is um, interesting to share about as well that would that led her into what she's doing today and who she's helping. And so before I go anymore, um, thanks for joining me today, Molly. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited for our conversation. Yeah, I am as well. So let's talk about just again in the as we connected through a friend of ours, Eric, um, you know, sh- you shared with me about kind of your eating disorder journey and um, your entrance into, into the army and what happened there. And I just would love, I thought it was different than other stories that I've shared before. And so I would love to start there um, for you to share that story. And then we'll kind of, we'll move on to mindset and, and whatnot from there. But just again, that the story of your eating disorder, again, things that have helped things that you found that uh, helped you on your recovery journey. Yeah, sure. Um, so going back to kind of when the, the eating disorder started about, you know, middle of high school, I, I was raised outside of the medical community. My family didn't go to doctors and, um, and I was in private schools. We didn't have health classes and things. And so I kind of thought I had discovered this really novel solution on my own of subtraction. And whenever I ate food, I could also throw it. And then this was just mathematical. It was addition and subtraction. And, um, at the, at the very beginning, I didn't know that this was a thing that other people already knew about and it wasn't, it wasn't good and it had repercussions. Um, I really, I really just thought of it as this, you know, mathematical process. And, um, like we said, I am an engineer or I, you know, grew up (laughs) to become an engineer and that is kind of how my, how my mind works. Um, and so I, at the, at the very beginning, I, I grew up in Southern California, where a lot of people just look like Barbie, and I have never looked like Barbie. And that was, you know, in my early early adolescence, that was upsetting or difficult for me. And I wanted to, I wanted to fit in. And I felt if I looked like everyone else, I would fit in. And so I kind of came up with this solution. And even though at the beginning, I started it as a just addition subtraction thing, right away, I somehow just knew it was something I had to hide, you know, and that like, you know, immediately like shame comes attached to it. And I just knew that it had to be my secret. And even without knowing a name for it or know that other people were doing this, that it was bad. I just, as soon as I started doing it, I just knew that I had to keep it a secret or people would stop me from doing it. And it became, you know, a part of my life. It became part of what I did every day and I didn't want anybody to stop me from it. And so I kept it, I kept it a secret. And I did this through through high school at, and into, into college, I went away 
far away from school for college and um, somewhere early in college in like the early 2000s or like there was a lot of like vegan, like vegan was very trendy for, for people my age or in college and maybe still is. So I started reading books on veganism and, you know, getting involved in that kind of community and kind of switched to this hybrid of like being vegan and and throwing up my food. And it became like just this very controlling thing, but I could put literature behind it. Like there were people saying, oh, you're not supposed to eat meat. And you're, you can, you can just, I remember like specifically there was a website, like 30 bananas a day. And um, like, there was this this whole community of people that are like, you only have to eat bananas. And I was like, fantastic. I will eat one banana a day. And there is, you know, a whole community of people to tell me that this is fine. So I kind of, I found the information I wanted to justify the actions that, that I wanted to take. And as um, I was, I was very shy and I, I've been very shy most of my life up until recently. So the eating control and the shyness really complemented each other because I'll, especially in, in college, I wouldn't go out with people because they're very often eating or drinking and I mm-hmm. didn't want to consume the calories and I didn't want to look weird or have people notice that I wasn't eating. Like I, I wanted to keep it secret so nobody would make me eat. So I just like withdrew and become more and more secluded and, and that, and the eating control and the isolation just really snowballed into each other. And I, you know, looking back on it, I don't, I don't even know if the disordered eating was isolating me or if I wanted to be isolated because I didn't know how to be a person. I, I really didn't know how to be a person until like 31 or 32, like I'm, I'm 35 now. So it, it's only been like, you know, three or four years that I've really even known how to be a person, my own person, and even wanted to be a person for, for so much time. I wanted to disappear. I wanted to be invisible, to blend in that want didn't even change until recently. I don't know if, if that kind of identity existed. And then the eating disorder was like, well, here's a method to to live that out or, you know, an excuse to keep you at home. Or if that kind of came out of the eating disorder, I don't know, which is the chicken and the egg, but they certainly complemented each other and really defined, they defined my teens and twenties of those Mm -hmm. two things, like wanting to be invisible, wanting to be isolated, just not feeling that I had anything to offer. And so I shouldn't go out anyways. And I did that all the way through college and at the, which was, also, these things are fantastic for your academic career. Like having no social life is great for your academic career. So in college, I got a degree of mechanical engineering from the, the College of Engineering. And then at the same time from the College of Arts and Sciences, I got a degree in physics with a minor in chemistry in the same five-year period with like a one-year co-op working thing in the middle. And I did well. I graduated with, with honors in both of those colleges on the same day because mm-hmm. I I you know, I could sit in my dorm room and read. And I got a great, I had applied for a job. I got a great job with um, great salary offer on my way out of school. And on my way, it was in a, to be a, a drilling engineer on an oil rig. Um, so I wanted to be outside and active and moving. And before I, I had accepted that job, but before I actually went to start at that job, you know, at the end of the summer after I graduated, I decided to join the army, which was kind of a sudden decision. My, my family certainly didn't see it coming and I didn't really talk a lot of it through with my family, but it meant, it meant a lot to me coming from like, you know, my, my generation has been like 9-11 happened early on in my life and really kind of outlined like this patriotism really kind of outlined a lot of, of my, you know, my teens and twenties also. And, and looking back, you know, knowing what I, knowing what I know now about how our beliefs underpin all of our actions, like our, our actions are just, you know, the result of our beliefs and they're really not any, they're not the initiating thing. It's the belief that's the initiating thing. And knowing what I know now, and I, I look back and see some of these decisions I made, I had, um, I had a really core 
belief that somebody in authority had told me when I was very young. And he had told me, we had been out and it's like some, some like pretty car drove by and I was like, Oh, pretty car. And he was like, do you know what kind of car it is? And I was like, no, like shiny, pretty. I don't, I don't know what kind of car it is. And he's like, see, that's why women will never make as much money as men. And like, you know, in retrospect, like what a a non sequitur comment to do, but I was young and they link in my mind, you know, like women will never make as much money as men. And that linked in my mind and, and it, it made me, it inspired action in me. And I was not a very bright kid. I didn't learn to read until like much later than everybody else learned to read. But so I had really kind of seen myself as dumb up until that point. And I was like, I will show you. And so I buckled down and I got to work and I got degrees in school. And I I specifically made the decision that, you know, I was going to go to college and in college, I would get a degree that, and I was going to make man money. And that was my phrase from, Mm. from early on in life that I was like, I'm going to make my own man money. And I had played instruments and been musical. And when I made the decision to go to college, I left all of the music behind because playing oboe is not going to make me man money. So I get my degrees in, you know, engineering and physics and chemistry. And then I come to graduation and I get this huge job offer to work in oil with like, you know, a huge, like a salary that I never expected. I was, I was making far more than this person who told me I'll never, you know, like make, that's why women don't make as much money as men. And all that like, you know, at what, 23, 24, when I graduate college, I would have been making more than, than he made as a grown man. I actually like, instead of being like, ah, victory and like allowing me to move on, like the kind of twisted way these beliefs work is like, I had this, the belief that said, I can't make that much money. And I ended up turning away from that job and doing something else that in the military, and I'm, I'm proud to have served and it meant many, many things to me to enlist and serve. But certainly in retrospect, one of those things was I had a belief that I wasn't capable of making that amount of money. And so when somebody is standing there in front of me, handing me that amount of money for valid work that I had actually done and earned, I couldn't accept it. I couldn't change my identity in the moment. I didn't know how to change my identity. And I didn't even know that them offering me this amount of money was actually threatening who I thought I was. Mm. So I, I couldn't follow through and, and take the job. Um, and I, I went into the military and I very much, another thing I remember from that period of time is being very uncomfortable calling adults by their first name. I had come from like a very like rigid conservative background where, you know, all your teachers were Mr. And, and Mrs. And, and, um, we didn't call adults by their first name. And I had this co-op school um, as an engineer where I went into an engineering office and was paid to do, you know, engineering work. And, and I was seen as an adult because I was an adult. And so everybody called each other by their first names. And this was daily uncomfortable for me hmm. to not call them professor, not call them something. And, and just to be like, walking around as equals. Like I had never before, I had never in my life been equals with the people around me by really by my my own judgment of myself, but I just had never felt that way. So it was like, it was daily uncomfortable to be in this office where people were looking at me as like an intelligent equal, you know, like, which it sounds strange. But even though you had, you had shown yourself the world that you were competent, you were smart, you were intelligent and all that, even though you saw all of that in front of you, you still didn't have that. The identity inside didn't line up with it. And it made me so uncomfortable. And so the, the idea of the military had been with me for, um, for a long time. And when I started to pursue that. And I realized in the military, they call each other by rank and last name. Mm-hmm. And that is really comfortable for me and r- the rank structure from, you know, from where I come from and everything, just having a structure of knowing who's above you and knowing who's below you and knowing where you stand mm. rank wise was just really comforting for me. It wasn't, it didn't feel rigid. Like, uh, you know, some people come in and they're like, Oh, this is difficult to adjust to. Like for me, no, like I, I, that, that rigidity and that's that structure 
was very familiar and comfortable. And so I really kind of like meshed in with that. And, and my whole life, I've been trying to disappear, like physically disappear, make my body disappear. And now I can put on camouflage and literally blend in with all of the people around me. And there was something really comforting about that too. I mean, I think it's fascinating. So all of this is fascinating, but I, and I think I shared with you in the pre conversation is that my son's in our youngest son is in the air force. Although that's what I saw too, is that when you go in, you know, within boot camp, like that's what they do. They make you, or do you all do the same thing? You wear the same thing. You take a little suitcase, right. With like a couple items, but otherwise they give you everything from your underwear to your, you know, uniform to your bed sheets and all that. And they want you to be the same in a good way. Cause you're going to be a team and you learn the impact of of a team and a group and a flight and all of that kind of stuff. But I find it interesting that you saw, I mean, and again, I think that can be very positive for people that feel lost, you know, perhaps lost in their life. Yeah. But you took it as you're just going to blend right in with them. Yeah. And that's all in retrospect too. Like at the time, at the time I would not have identified myself as lost. I would have identified myself as like a high achiever because of what I had done accomplished in college, that's all kind of, you know, in retrospect, understanding, Mm -hmm. you know, a kind of understanding really, really what was driving my decisions and what was like narrowing my focus on what what I was allowing myself to see in the world and what I was not allowing myself to Mm -hmm. see in the world based off of the identity I held. And, and the, the army was a fantastic place for me. I, I didn't, I didn't know how to be a person. I didn't know who I wanted to be. I didn't know anything. And the army was a fantastic place for me. And the first thing, the first thing that I did by going through basic training is I had to eat food. Like there is no hiding, even, even though you're, you know, you're all wearing the same thing. Like the, the drill sergeants are watching you and you have to physically, you have to physically keep up. You can't be exhausted and you mm-hmm. can't not show physical progress, uh, you know, through the 10 weeks as your training progresses, you need to keep up with with everybody as they get stronger and there's more stamina and more endurance. And I had to eat and that was that. And there was, you know, it just became obeying orders and it just became what you had to do. And it, it took a lot of the the mental obsession out of my, out of my control. I, there was no use in obsessing over it. I couldn't do anything about it. And it just took that burden away from me. And that was, you know, a fantastic feeling. And I, it was something I wasn't able to do for myself. I mean, I find it fascinating again, that that, again, it's so like, when you think about that, again, we saw that with our son and what you went through, but then our daughter's been in numerous treatment and that's kind of what they do there. They take away your control and say, this is what you have to eat. And you have to eat now and you have to do this and you have to go to the bathroom now and all that. And similar, it would seem I'm doing air quotes, but similar to what you experienced, but I don't know. I think, well, there's probably, we could talk about that for a long time, but like the impact of treatment can be really good, but it's also you're around other people that are struggling with the same thing that you are, as opposed to what you did. You went in perhaps not even, no one even knew your secret of how you controlled your eating. And so you just blended in and you followed the rules. Like all of a sudden that struggle, I mean, you told me it just, I mean, that's kind of was what got rid of that struggle and that those behaviors. So I find that fascinating. It's similar thing, but again, different, I guess, different populations, if you will, or different groups of people in those two different places. And it really served you well. Mm -hmm. And I've also seen my daughter go through it for seven years and she's still, I mean, she's doing great, but there's still struggles, even though she knows what she's supposed to eat and she knows what she's supposed to do. And if you would just follow the rules, then things would be better, right? Yeah. It's just, it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, from there I did about four years in the army and the eating never, never came back in the army. Like it was a different, like it was a reset button. Like I was a different, I was a different person. I was in this Mm -hmm. kind of structured environment around people. They didn't have the problem. Like you said, it just wasn't, it wasn't on mind at all. And then about actually pretty, pretty early on, but I ended up staying in the army for four years. I hurt my back and tried to 
tried to hide it and cover it up, you know, um, the way I had other things. And, and at that point, it's because I had found a tribe, like I had found somewhere where, you know, wanting to go in and being not seen, I ended up actually being seen and having this squad that I went through a lot of, you know, I was with for a long, long period of, of training and, and work together and actually knowing each other. And I hadn't had that in college. I kept a, or in high school, I, and then in life, we had moved around every couple of years, always in the middle of the school year. So I really, I didn't have a friend group that I had grown up with in high school. I kept myself very isolated. I had gone to some different schools and moved around in the middle of, of high school, which most people kind of start at the beginning and go to the end with one group. And I hadn't done that. And, and in college, although I stayed there the whole time, I just kept myself really isolated. And so I, I had never had this friend group of people who actually knew me and I knew them just genuinely, like there was, nobody was, nobody was faking it. Nobody was trying to look like Barbie and, and we all just kind of liked each other and then I got I got hurt and I didn't want to like not I didn't want to not keep up with them and I didn't want to get kicked out of the military or be put onto like a different kind of job away from away from what I had trained to do so I hid that for I don't I I probably hid it for like six months and my my squad would help me I would I hurt my hurt my my back and it would hurt and I had this sciatica down my leg that hurt really bad. And so I would just run like every, every moment I was awake, I would run. Um, and I thought this was making like moving was making it better, but it turns out it's just endorphins from when you're, you're running mask the pain. And I was actually making the injury much worse by like doing all this impact on it. And it was just like the endorphins from running that were making me feel better. So when I did finally go, you know, to a sick call and get help with it, that turned out not to be the right solution. But I, I would try to hide it and would be standing still in, in formation was so painful to just stand still with. It turned out to be like some herniated discs that were like impinging a nerve. And I couldn't really feel my right leg except for the sciatica, but I couldn't really feel it other than that. And I would just pass out. I would just, I probably started holding my breath or something, you know, to in, in pain and I would just pass out. And, and my squad would like, I'd wake up, they'd like drag me to the back of the formation and like put me, you know, like prop me up against something. And like, this just happened, you know, periodically. And I like one time we were out training and I had a rifle and I could tell I was about to, I could tell I was about to pass out. So I like, I hand someone in my squad, I'm like, hey, can you hold my rifle really fast? And so he's like, sure. He like holds my rifle and then I pass out. And when I come to like my squad was telling me, they're like, hey, you hit the ground really hard. And next time, if you know you're going to pass out, like, why don't you put your rifle down and then have me catch you? And I was like, oh, like, I didn't, I didn't think of that. I just thought like, it would be bad to like fall down with a weapon, you know? So I was like, I didn't, I didn't think of that. So this was like, it was a really good group of people that I was really happy to be around. And one of them also, so the, the army gave me pain medication, told me function as, as I recovered and stuff. And I grew up in this non-medical background. So I really didn't understand that. And I see people taking Tylenol and ibuprofen, which I had never taken in my life. So I didn't really understand that the, the prescription pain medication that had come from, you know, the army doctor was different than the Tylenol ibuprofen that people are just popping all the time. So I'm popping it all the time and it makes me feel awesome. Like my, my back doesn't hurt. I can do everything and I can keep up with everything. It like, it seemed, it seemed in my short sighted mind to solve all the problems. And I really didn't understand what it was. And someone in that squad too, he told me, he said, Hey, stuff you're taking is a people can get addicted to it, even though it's prescription and you're not doing anything by taking it. Sometimes people get addicted to it and it becomes a lifelong problem even after the injury is healed. And I had no exposure. Like I, I was like a really sheltered, like, you know, and, and in college when maybe people are experimenting with stuff, like I was studying physics and right. mechanics, right. you know, like I, I wasn't, like I had barely, I was barely, you know, socially drinking even over 21. So I really had mm -hmm. no experience with this stuff. So that has been just such a, a blessing in my life that somebody early on told me 
that so that I just had it, I had it as a data point. I had the information to make better decisions so that nothing snuck on me. Mm -hmm. And um, that was just, I'm, I'm always so grateful just that he was, you know, felt comfortable telling me that was just so honest with me. Um, And I did uh, after about four years, the army didn't Mm -hmm. kick me out. They med boarded me. I couldn't wear body armor. I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't want to take enough pain pills where I just couldn't feel my body and do things. Um, I didn't think that was a good solution. Uh, and I ended up getting med boarded and having to leave the army, which was tremendously shameful to me. And like, a um, a loss of an identity that I had just stumbled upon. I didn't know how mm-hmm. to rebuild another one. I had just stumbled on it. And I came out of the military. I had a boyfriend in the military and he got out. Um, his just term of service ended about the same time I got out. And so we stayed together and he became my identity. And everything, you know, everything just, he was my link to the whole world. I no longer had a squad of people that I knew and that they knew me. And we had all these, you know, experiences together and that we would hang out together. Like it all just, I just put all of it on him, you know, without, without his asking me to, or anything, but he, like my, my world just zeroed down on him. And I can't speak, I can't speak for his story, but, but, but you know, part of his story impacts my story, but he was a, an alcoholic. And so his world zeroed in around something else. Mm-hmm. Then I zeroed in around him and I applied for jobs. I had I had a job offer like before my even like leave as I was leaving the army before that leave even expired. I had job offers. I went into aerospace and defense just as an engineer, which is what I had training to do. And I got my salary of making man money, which I, you know, after four years of making army enlisted money, I wasn't an officer. I was enlisted. Um, so after making that kind of money, I was <laughs> ready for a bigger paycheck. And um, I accepted that job. And my boyfriend followed me out to Connecticut, which is far from home for both of us. And neither one of us had family here. So I went to work and obsessed over him. And that was Mm -hmm. my life for like three years. And he, he, and his, his disease and his, you know, myopic focus worsened and stuff too throughout that time. And I, I had I don't know. I didn't have, I didn't have any skills. I didn't really understand what was going on. I, I, I was just, I just became like obsessed with him and the relationship and controlling it. And, and I was going to my job and I was performing well at my job, but also trying to be invisible. I, I often stuttered. Um, I didn't want to present my own work, even though I was doing good work and, and people above me were very happy with it. I would just hand it off to my boss and let him present it for me because I didn't want to stand behind it. And um, so my, my career wasn't really going super well because they were like, well, she just wants to stay behind the scenes. So just let her keep handing her off work to other people. And those people were getting promoted and I was getting resentful and, you know, things with the, the boyfriend weren't going well and I was growing resentful and he had all this side stuff going on and I was growing resentful. And there must have been a point because we were talking about mindset. So it must have been a point that you, you know, were introduced to somebody or had some type of yeah. realization or. I start bre- I start breaking down and I, I had a panic attack, a heart attack. And then, and then at work one day, I just broke down sobbing and I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop crying. And I was in the office full of like mostly grown men, like that are a generation older than me. And I'm just sobbing and I can't, I can't, I can't stuff it back inside anymore. And that sent me to, you know, personal growth and personal development and to try to understand. I'm like, like I'm, and I had to study, study my way out of it. Um, Like learn, learn about the mind, learn about stuff like that, go to counseling, talk to somebody, which was very helpful and I, I found Bob Proctor who said he had like a, a tagline and it, like, if you work with him in a year from now, it'll, you'll take a telescope to see where you 
are, you know, to look back and see where you are. You'll need a telescope in a year. And I was like, well, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> like, I want that. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care which direction I go. Like, I just like, I just am f- really far from here in a year. That found, sounds fantastic. So I started on one of his coaching programs and learning from him. And he taught me about the subconscious mind and he taught me about identity and beliefs, uh, you know, as being things that we hold about ourselves that they determine our habits and our actions. And then it's those habits and actions that are the visible things that, that appear to produce the results that we're getting. But even you know, upstream of those habits are, are the beliefs and, and the identity that we hold of ourselves. And so he taught me to do what, what I call now is just changing on purpose. In my whole life, I had changed on accident. I had changed as a result of like, my, my back getting hurt. Like somebody telling me women won't make money. And then I said, Oh, I'll show you. I'll be smart. And, you know, like looking around and saying like, I don't look like other people. And so I changed my eating as a you know, reaction to that. And, and the military said, you hurt your back, you have to leave. And so I, I, I changed all these things. I was changing in response to stuff I couldn't control. And, and he taught me that the way we can change on purpose, the way we can determine our own path and determine like the person, make ourselves into the person we want to be is through a goal. You pick a goal of the person that you want to be. And maybe the person you want to be has a boat or has a million dollars or, but it's not about the boat or the million dollars. It's being the person that has achieved those goals. And so you, you take that goal and you use, you be, allow yourself to become emotionally involved in that goal. You allow yourself to want to be that person. And that becomes the impetus for your change. And then that, the resulting change pulls you in the direction that you want to go instead of being ping-ponged by whatever happens to show up. So I was studying all of that in my personal life, you know, in order to become a person in order to learn how to like person myself. Um, and my, like resultingly my career took off because I started standing behind my own work. I started seeing things at work that I wanted to change procedural things that I wanted decisions to be made. I wanted data-driven decisions to be made in the engineering environment instead of gut decisions because the people with the guts capable of making these decisions are tiring very quickly. And uh, mm-hmm. so data-driven decisions seems to be a sustainable path forward. And I decided I wanted that to be how it was. And so that became my goal. And it, it, in order to accomplish that goal inside the company I was at, I had to become a new person. I couldn't stutter. I had to stand behind my own work. These were my own ideas. Nobody else was talking about them. So I had to formulate how to say them myself. And in doing that, I got shuttled way up to like, like vice president level decision makers because they were the only other people using these words. And like nobody between me and them had these kind of concepts. So like instantly it brought me like way up to this different business level than I had ever been on. And, and for the first time, like I wanted to be there. I wanted to have the discussion. I wanted to be seen with my ideas. I wanted to be given funds and resources to make my ideas come, you know, come to life to show other people what was in my mind. And I became, um, by applying this process of like taking a goal, using the goal to initiate the change in myself, to become a different person and to live in the same body as a different person. And, and that happened because of mindset. I mean, this is, all of this is, is mindset. And it really kind of changed my idea of like, what does doing the work look like? And if like my understanding now, like what does doing the work look like? It looks like sitting there with your eyes. Very often it looks like simply sitting there with your eyes closed. Sometimes it looks like sitting there writing in a journal. Sometimes it looks like sitting there sobbing. It looks like things like that. And then the results of doing that work might look like going back to school and getting a degree. It might look like, you know, like I, I had to learn to, to code, write computer programs I had never done before. And, I, and but I had become a new person. That person needed that skill. And so I stayed up at night for a couple of weeks and learned how to do it. That person I wanted to be needed that skill. And that skill came very easily because it was aligned with, you know, the, the goal and the person I was becoming. So I don't like the actual 
learning the new programming wasn't doing the work. Doing the work was sitting there with my eyes closed thinking, who is the person I want to be? Right. Well, I think that, you know, so much if we, you know, if we talk about goal setting, and again, I'm in a business where I coach people to have a successful entrepreneurial business, um, or just, again, we can coach ourselves to be a better, you know, whatever. Oftentimes it's the, we put the, the goal is the, the trip, you know, the goal is to, is the boat or is the shiny car or whatever. But I love this way of thinking because I've heard it before. And I think you do a wonderful job explaining it. Like it's, we can, we can still get the boat, right? We can still get the advancement in our career, but we have to start to visualize who we are who is that person that drives that boat? Who is that person that Mm -hmm. is a successful vice president of such and such an X, Y, Z and think about what that feels like, right. And what, what it feels like and what it looks like and what we feel like and what that, you know, and I don't know if you've ever done any of these exercises that made me think of a coach that I worked with for a while. And we had a, a gathering at her home and she said, when you come, you're going to, and I forget what she called it. But um, when you come, you're going to you're going to be the person that you are five years from now. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have this interaction in our, you know, before we had dinner, we had like a 40, an hour and a half, you know, like just networking or chatting with each other. But we were to come in like the person we were five years. And I'm telling you, it was a fascinating discussion with others, you know, for the way that people saw us and reacted to us or things like that. And even me talking with others when they were talking about like, oh, this is, you know, I remember it was a holistic physician and she talked about this whole center that she had developed and, and bought this property. And then this was, I was like, that's really cool. And so we had these discussions, but it wasn't, they weren't, they weren't around things that were happening today. That was like in our, but it was so, I mean, I left feeling, wow, that like, I was so excited about what I, who I had become. Right. And it's that type of, and it just motivated me, which I think what you're saying, it motivates us to Mm -hmm. then, like you said, do the work. You got to figure out how to code. You have to figure out how to make the phone calls. You have to figure out how to bake the bread. If you want to be a baker and owner, whatever it is, but that doing the work Mm -hmm. isn't so perhaps difficult. You know, that it's something necessary because you're helping yourself become that person that you want to be to accomplish those, right? To accomplish the goals, to get that car, to get the boat, to be the VP, that type of thing. It's a totally, it's a different way than what we hear oftentimes about goal setting, Mm -hmm. you know? And when I've talked so much in this podcast about eating disorders and addictions and how they become your identity. I just think, again, this is a fascinating conversation. I'm so glad we've had it that, when people like, for instance, there's an episode of somebody that she was a, a ice skater growing up and um, she was quite good. And then her family had to move across the country because of the job and she couldn't ice skate there. And that's when her eating disorder happened because and started because she didn't know who she was without mm-hmm. the skating, mm-hmm. you know. And so her eating disorder took on that. I, that was her identity. That's what she you know, what you were saying was focused on and that's it. She became secretive and stuff like that. And to get out of her eating disorder, she had to figure out who she was Mm -hmm. without that, like what her identity. And I think it's very, again, there's such interesting parallels here, but also very different than other stories that I've been able to share here. And, um, and again, just it been fascinating. And again, I love this mindset work in the way that you, again, you are an engineer, so you can really explain it quite, quite well. Yeah. So I think it's like there, I, I see these like two kind of opposite ways of using, using the brain. Like one, you can start with who you think you are, which is this identity that other people have assigned to you. Like you've picked mm. it up by other people telling you, like, you're, you're not smart. You're, you're a woman, you're not pretty, you are pretty, you know, like what, whether it's good or bad and you pick up an identity mm-hmm. from other people, you can assume that that is your true identity and start acting from it. And in like what kind of physically is happening in your brain is things get wired together as these circuits and, and highways. And, and the more we travel them, the stronger they get and the easier it is to continue 
traveling them. And then mm-hmm. that, those highways that you just traveled once or twice became the preferred ones. And now you've traveled them thousands of times and it's your identity becomes wired brain. And then when you go to look to the outside world and there's infinite possibilities of all the different things that could happen, all the different things you could be and you could do, like your brain down selects and just like kicks out everything that doesn't line up with your identity. And it, it literally doesn't even show it to your conscious thinking mind. You are blind to things, opportunities in the world that don't align with who you who you think you are. And so instead of trying to fight that, and instead of trying to like chisel out these opportunities in the world from where you you are, you can like reverse engineer the process and say, all right, I, I know that there are infinite possibilities in the world just by like all things. There is, there's so many different things that could happen and that I could do in the world. Who would I have to be in order for my mind to show me those things? You know, if I want to be, you know, now I'm now I'm in business for myself. Like I've left the corporate world. I need to see an entirely different population in the world to work with individually than I did when I was an engineer in a corporate company. I, I need to actually see different things in the world. And so instead of trying to go out into the world and help people with mindset from my own my old identity as a corporate engineer, I need to change the identity I have to somebody who helps people that come across my path. And then I need to arrange a path that comes across people who need help. And and I kind of reverse engineer that by, by thinking, who do I have to be? And then I sit there with my eyes closed and I picture myself being that person. Like I feel the emotions in my body, myself being that person. And that is teaching my brain. That is forcing my brain to make new connections. Mm -hmm. And then I am consciously deciding every moment to run the new connections and, and ignore the old, stronger connections. And that's a decision that I get to make by my own like empowerment to be the person decided that I want to be. And then the, the world shows up to me differently. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, again, an awesome way to talk about it and explain it. And like you said, a little while back, you are making those changes or making those decisions on purpose, you know, um, not by accident. And um, again, and I, again, we could talk about this for a very long time because there is the Joe, the Bob Proctor and the Joe Dispenza and the subconscious and the mm-hmm. reticular activating system and all of that. And we don't mm-hmm. have time for all of that today, but the, the, but people can look into that or they can contact you for more information about that. But again, I think that's so it's, it's just, I always say it's, it's funny how the universe shows up and tells me things because this was a morning that I just was a little dis disjointed, if you will, I think the last couple of days. And so this morning I didn't go and do my regular morning routine with it. I sit and I journal and I close my eyes and those type of things. And I felt a little, again, I wasn't, I'm feeling like I'm standing, like, what am I supposed to be you know, like standing on that three or four way stop and like, what am I supposed to do next? But I know that after this, I'm going to go sit in the backyard and do some of that meditating. Because again, that's where, that's what I talk with people all the time is that morning routine of like sitting and quiet and, and imagining and journaling. And then, you know, and like imagining again, what you, who do you have to be in order to get what you want Mm -hmm. or to become who you want or create this life that you want. Because the cool thing is the life is all out there that you can have, but you've got to look at, we have to look at ourselves, right. And yeah, try to think of who we will be and look like when, when that life is there that we, that we want. Yeah. It's very fascinating. Yeah. And no one else can do it for us. You know, that's why I said, like, I just wasn't a person until 30 or mm-hmm. 31. I didn't, as I hadn't ever, I hadn't ever done that for myself until then. And it's, it's sometimes scary work to like mm-hmm. become the person that God intended you to be, you know, or whatever, however you want to say that it's scary to, again, not have those, um, not that you 
that we don't have friends and family and communities and stuff like that, but being our own individual, not being defined, I think you said it earlier, not being defined by what somebody else says we are, you know, who we are. I mean, my grandmother years ago, God rest her soul, I remember her saying, you know, you want, oh, well, Moira, she always has a little trouble with things. Like, what does that mean? But still 58, I'm 58. Like, I still remember that. As a teenager, she used to say that my two older sisters, I mean, I went on to believe that my two older sisters were so much smarter than I was. And when I was in college with one of them and she was seemingly being visited by my parents more than me because of her all valedictorian and mortarboard or whatever the stuff that she was involved in that, you know, because I always had trouble with things. Mm. So like they become these self-fulfilling prophecy by what somebody else said. Yes. I mean, I'd love, you know, the day that I get to speak with my grandmother again, like, what will you, what did you mean by that? You know, and I can wait till that day, or I can just go on and say, you know what? I always figure things out. I mean, because that's who I became. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's because my grandmother said that because I'm like, I think that's part of the reason why I loved being a nurse. Um, and I didn't like some things about nursing, but I went on to have be in medical sales and I had my own thing and now I have my own job and I figured it out. I didn't have a business degree. I didn't have a, but I am a very successful, you know, top leader in my company after 22 years. I just figured it out because that's the kind of person I am. It's sometimes people are like, well, why did you do that? I'm like, well, that's just what you do. And perhaps now that I'm sitting and talking to you today, it could have been because my gra- one of those things that my grandmother said, we always have trouble. Guess what? I'm not going to, I don't intentionally remember saying, well, I'm not going to have trouble. I'm going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. But that's who I became in my life is somebody that figures things out. And you can just tell me and like, come on, I'll come on, let's do it. I'll do it. Let's go. You know? Mm-hmm. So it's very interesting. And it's cool. You know? Yeah. And our words are, our words are powerful when we speak them to ourselves. And when we speak to other people, especially young other people, you know, mm-hmm. we right. they tell them things that are just like things like, like your grandmother might not even remember saying that to you, but it mm-hmm. had such an impact. Right. Yeah. And so um, as we wrap up this conversation, um, I, you know, so you have left a regular engineering job and now you're in your own business and coaching other people in this mindset and, you know, being the mindset engineer. and. Um, I think that's, I think it's fascinating. And I would love for you to share with us. I mean, you shared a little bit of that kind of what you help people do. And so I'd love for you to just, again, even if it's just saying that again, what you really help people as you coach them and how you can find, how people can find you and um, kind of what that looks like when they're coaching with you, if it's individual or group coaching or pro, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, I do individual, like one-on-one, I work with people for coaching for about six months. And I teach you, I teach you this, this different way to use your brain to this reverse engineering way, instead of just taking the identity you have and and projecting it out on the world and then getting to pick from whatever it is that you can see to kind of reverse engineer. What would you like the world to show up to you? Who do you have to be in order to see that in the world. And so teach you that process. And then in the six months through teaching you that process, we actually go through, we pick a goal and we work on that goal in kind of programming it, reprogramming, whatever the belief is that like just has trouble with things and reprogram that to, I figure things out, you know, so we kind of pick, pick that swap. That's going to be a core belief and identity making belief and reprogram it. And, And through the process, I really, um, explain to you why we're doing all the steps so that you have this repeatable process for goal after goal and to share with the, you know, the people around you. And much of that, like the way we kind of identify those beliefs is just in conversation. We start to talk about like, well, what does, what does what's happening right now that isn't what you want it to be? Like what's the, all the detail of that situation, like a movie scene, and then write down the movie scene that you would want to play instead. And then we kind of, we compare the two and things are going to come out in people's language when I'm speaking with them that I hear in their own language, things that they don't hear themselves saying often because we've said them about ourselves so many times, like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to go over that. I'm not good at, I'm not good at that. Or I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out and network there because I'm shy. And 
And then, you know, I'd, I'd pick up on something like that and be like, well, who's, who says, who says you're shy? And do you, would you like to continue to be shy? Is that lined up with your goal? So things that people don't hear themselves say because they believe it to be true, they wouldn't even question it. It's helpful to have an external person mm -hmm. to help you question that. And as I'm doing that, telling you, hey, I'm pulling these things out and questioning them because their beliefs and, and beliefs aren't true or false, but they shape what happens. And so at the end of the six months, I kind of train people to replace my part of the process with their journal. So where at the beginning, it's like, it's them and me talking back and forth. By the end, it's, it's you and you talking back and forth. It's you running the old program that limits what you see in the world. And then you acknowledging that you're the programmer and not the program and ask, you know, interrogating the program. And so you play both of those roles by the end and you use your journal to kind of write, write things down from both perspectives so that you can compare them. Mm -hmm. And that's really the process I'm teaching people to do. And I, I kind of translate between two vocabularies. There's a metaphysical vocabulary. Some people like the universe, manifestation, law of attraction. They like these, these concepts and those concepts have meaning to them. And other people like scientific language and they want to talk about the, the RAS system. They want to talk about the circuitry in the brain. They want to talk about dopamine and, and the role of all of these things. And I will speak either of those vocabularies. I'm very comfortable in this scientific world that's mm -hmm. my engineering brain is very happy with um all of the you know qualitative measurements and science that's going on to support what the metaphysical community has known for much 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 longer than the scientific community but there is now a scientific language to match with it and so i can kind of help people translate back and forth or speak through it in a language that they like i think there are there are many people who don't like words like you know, energy healing or manifestation and and they shut themselves off from a lot of personal growth and a lot of development that they could do in their lives a lot of power that they have because they don't like the vocabulary and so i'm happy to work with those people in a different vocabulary set to make these tools available to them mm -hmm. yeah yeah excellent that's great you do have a, a website that people can find you at i I have um, mindset-engineering.com. Um, I am on Facebook as Mindset Engineer, and I'm on more actively on LinkedIn as Mindset Engineer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, Molly. This is really fascinating. And uh, um, as I've said before with my podcast, like so helpful for me. <laughs> I love it. I love that um, this podcast, if you will, has been very therapeutic and learning for me. Um, I love to um, bring guests on that I know my audience is going to really love to hear from, but I'm part of that audience and I love to hear from. So I learned a lot from you today and I really, really appreciate you sharing all this. And again, know that I, again, appreciate it, learn so much. And I know that the audience will too. So thank you for being on here and sharing all this. And thank you again, I wish you all the best. And I really hope people connect with you because that's a really, again, it's a fascinating um, shift in our thinking, if you will, in our mindset, when we, instead of having those goals, which are on my wall over there, I keep pointing over there, because that's where some of my goals are of what I want to create every month. Instead of that, it's really like sitting here and thinking more about who do I need to be in order to, you know, make, you know, create those. So um, really, really fascinating stuff. So thanks for sharing that today, Molly. Appreciate you being here. And thanks audience for being here as well. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, please share these episodes with others. I texted Eric this morning and thanked him for the connection and we'll thank him again after this. It was a great connection um, and I uh, really loved you being here. And so everybody, uh, again, thanks again and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. If you like this podcast, head over to iTunes and leave me a five-star review. Share it with others and make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a thing. I've got a tribe over on Facebook, so head over there and search for Juggling the Chaos of Recovery Podcast Tribe. And do you know somebody who has a story, a story to share, a story of recovery and hope? Please let me know as I'd love to feature them as a guest on one of these next upcoming podcasts. 
And perhaps you're looking for a community of like-minded, collaborative, and supportive people who cheer each other on as we strive to improve our lives. If that sounds like something you've been looking for, schedule some time with me. You'll find the links in the show notes. Let's talk and let me help you find your way. And I'm here to tell you that you're worth it.